So welcome back everyone. I'm pleased to introduce uh, our second uh, invited speaker this afternoon, Pro Professor Eric Knudsen, uh, who's a filmmaker and Professor of Visual and Digital Culture at Bournemouth University's uh, Media School. Um, over to you, Eric. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you very much for inviting me. Great to meet you all. In fact, you know, I was sitting there listening to Rachel, and I thought, well, she's kind of said all the things I have. <laughs> so, but, but, so thank you, that was, that was really great. And I think, you know, I'm going to echo a lot of the things that Rachel's actually said, but I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm not going to talk about my work at all, uh, but, but as Andy said, I am a filmmaker, and um, I've been involved in the whole practice bait debate for I can't believe it, over 20 years we've been talking about this. And although we've been talking about this for 20 years, but Rachel is saying that the debate has been won and that there is a second wave, just the fact that we're still talking about this, I think means that we're not quite there yet. Because there are some lingering issues we need to overcome. And I, actually, I think those main issues are in the practice-based researchers themselves. Because I think politically, the debate has been won, particularly at HEFI level and AHRC level. There are still some institutions who are dragging their feet, I think, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to particularly talk about it from my perspective as a peer reviewer for the AHRC, as a recipient of AHRC grants. I've been through that process. I sit on that panel, so I've been involved in making final decisions about bids, uh, uh, grants that are given. And also, just a little bit of feedback, you know, echoing the stuff about REF. So coming back to some of their feedback about what's going on. And then I want to simplify the whole process. Because I think part of the problem around these issues is that we are overcomplicating it. That, as my title suggests, <laughs> you know, as Gertrude Science said, a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. And sometimes, and I think this goes to, I think your question, and I think the question about the written element, we can get confused, I think, and slightly distracted. And I think you, you suggested that as well, Rachel, about issues that we really should be moving beyond. And that's really what I want to talk about, looking at it from a different perspective. So certainly the departments I'm involved with, we have these debates all the time practice-led research, practice as research, practice through research. And people are grappling with these con concepts. In some cases, people are clear about what it means. In other cases, they're not. And certainly, I think part of the consequence of that is that it detracts from actually what we're trying to do, which is to generate new knowledge and to do so in original ways that have significance. And that if we get too bogged down in particular definitions of things, we'll actually become slaves to very particular processes. And I hope that some of the suggestions I'm going to make can sort of just open up a little bit what that might mean. We still have a, you know, in certain institutions, there's still a situation where we're using these terms in the debate with our managers. And they keep asking, well, what is practice-based research? What is practice-led research? What is practice through research? And we don't have ready answers. And then we start to have a two-tier system happening, where you have the sociologists and the cultural theorists saying, well, we do proper research. And these guys are artists and, you know, there's kind of two kinds of research that's going on. And the point I want to make is, research is research. Knowledge is knowledge, but there are many different ways of generating that knowledge. And what I think we need to do is to have a debate with our colleagues in different disciplines on equal terms. That means we talk to them about research. But an archaeologist will do research in particular ways, anthropologists, visual anthropologists, sociologists, visual sociologists, scientists, etc., will do their research in different ways. And the other thing that I think has happened, certainly in the institutions I've been involved with, is that the people driving the research agenda 
traditionally come from the more academic backgrounds. In other words, they're cultural theorists, they are sociologists, certainly in my institution, that's what it is, you know, the director of research, that's where he comes from. He wants to encourage practice. They want to encourage practice, but they don't know what it means. They can't quite understand, is this good research or is this bad research? Is this quality research? Eric, is this good? That's what they ask me. We can't, you know, so we do our internal ref, mock ref exercises and we start submitting practice because in my department last time round they didn't submit any practice to the ref. That's how nervous they were about research, about practice led, so called practice led research. And we do this mock exercise where you have these sociologists and cultural theories looking at a film. And then they turn to me and say, is this, is this good, Eric? So I think we still have some work to do at institutional level. But the problem, I feel, is not our managers. The problem is us and our ability to articulate the research, to express it, to identify what is the research value in this, and then to have an equal debate with our colleagues in different disciplines. And in my area, I think in performing arts and certain other disciplines, actually, the debate is more advanced, particularly in the performing arts, I think, where there was a concerted effort right back in the 90s to try and identify and, 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 and kind of define what practice-based research was in performance. I think less so in film and media practice, which is, which is uh, kind of my area. And part of the, uh, the, the issue around this is that I work with colleagues who lack confidence. They lack confidence in the fact that what they're doing is of, has research value, and that they can go and talk with their colleagues who are in sociology or in the sciences and, and, and feel equal to them. And part of the reason is because they don't quite know how to articulate that research, how to express it. So interestingly, if we go back to some of the ref feedback that, that Rachel was referring to, there are some interesting clues. There's no doubt that Hefke want more practice. In fact, they wanted practice way back in 2001. RAE 2001, they were crying out for practice. RAE 2008, they were crying out for practice. The institutions were nervous. But there are some issues, you know, around universities understanding how to encourage uh, a kind of understanding about what is the research in the practice. How can we identify what that is? Looking at the definition of what research actually is. The other thing they talked about, I know this is not all about ref, but it does give us some pointers. This 300 word statement. Um, you know, we as a community have a wonderful opportunity to define our field. Those who are assessing our work, we think they're our peers, but they're not strictly speaking our peers, and I'll come back to that in more detail later when I talk about the decision-making process in the AHRC. They are fellow academics, but they're often not filmmakers or artists. And they want us to more clearly give indicators. What what Rachel was talking about in terms of signposting, what the value of this research is, what is the research component of this. They just want a 300 word statement to help them. Because actually, they don't know. They don't know. And I think it's very important that we as a community start to take charge of that articulation. We need to be able to talk about what is the research value in this project. Ref wanted in 300 words, but there are other ways of talking about it. We've, we've touched on documentation. We've touched on complementary written work. There are other ways of signposting what the research value is. And interestingly, you look at the research panel, I think, uh, 36, for example, which I think most of you will be involved with in some way or other. I, 
don't think you know there was a single practitioner on that panel. I know John Adams was involved <coughs> from Bristol, but actually when I speak to uh, 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 what's it, uh, Peter Golding, who was the chair of our, uh, you know, 36. He's saying, look, when we look at the practice, actually it's really good. But we don't always know what the research value is in it. And I think, you know, I always tell my PhD students, you've got to be able to explain your problem, your research problem, your question to your grandmother. And it has to make sense, yeah? <laughs> I mean, I read Einstein's general theory of relativity and special theory of relativity, and it made sense to me, even though I'm not a scientist. And I think so when we're dealing with, when we say we're dealing with our peers, they are more likely than not to be outside our very specific field. And that's why it becomes very, very important for us as a research community to define that field, to say, this is what I'm doing, this is the area I'm working in, this is what I'm trying to do, and this is actually where the value in my work is. Then they can agree with it or disagree with it. I think, you know, if I look at my experience of the HRC, I look at work regularly that's been submitted as a peer review. Are there, are there any other peer reviewers in here from HRC? No, okay. It's very, it's very interesting because I don't see very much. There aren't as many applications going in as you think there might be. Or if there are, they're not going beyond a certain threshold. You know, they have a, a, a system where they have one, two, three, four, five, six, and anything above four is fundable. Anything under, under four is not fundable. So they'll go through a f first a technical process of literally uh, cutting out applications where the font size is too big or you've handed in one page too many in your, in your case for support. So they'll literally get rid of all those. And then they'll, they'll send it out to peer reviewers. And if those peer reviewers come back with a score of less than two, for example, it won't go forward to the next stage. Any work that's marked as you know three and above is likely to go to the panel stage. Now what happens is these peer reviewers are people like you and I who will look at this work, two or three people on a project, sometimes as a technical review, and they will generally be in our field. The next stage is that if it goes to the next stage, it goes to a panel. Now that's where it becomes interesting because you, know, you have a panel of archaeologists, English linguists, uh, you know, at the last panel I sat on, I was the only person from the creative arts. And we're looking at everything. I mean, I'm looking at linguistic stuff. But what we're doing is that we are reviewing the reviewers because they don't always agree. And sometimes there's a huge variation, so the panel has to make a judgment, not only about the reviews, but the applicant usually has an opportunity to respond to the reviews. I'm talking here about the research grants, yeah? the big, big research grants that go up to a million quid or whatever. And what's interesting is that actually these panels, you know, I looked at something about linguistics, for example. It made sense to me. I could look at a project like that and I could understand what the problem was they were trying to solve. I could understand the questions they were asking and I could understand the methods they were going to use to explore it. And I could understand all of that, even though I was not an expert. That's how good these bids were. And the feedback I've heard from the AHRC is that often when it comes to creative practice bids, they really fall down in that clarity, particularly around methodology. And I think, therefore, as a community, we've got to recognize that you know, and I'll come back to the quality of peer reviewing in a minute because uh, I, think, I think we have issues there as well. But we've got to recognize that we do research and the people who are going to judge us do research. And they're not distinguishing about so much about whether something is practice or whether it's theoretical or whether it's, you know, 
uh, what kind of study it is. They're looking at a number of other qualities, which I'll come back to in a little bit more detail. Um, Journal of Media Practice, which was launched in the late 90s, and uh, uh, Rachel already mentioned ScreenWorks, which was part of it to begin with. It's now, that's now separate. Um, a text-based journal publication that was about media practice. Now, we have issues there because, of course, how do we publish practice in a written-based journal? So what has happened, of course, over the years is that it's become dominated, in a sense, by um, scholarly and theoretical research. It's of sometimes about practice, but not always. And what we're looking to do now is to how can we actually, we've got a new issue coming out in the future, you know, disruptive media issue. How can we actually not only go online, but play on these tensions between the written word and the kind of creative so we're working on that issue. But again, I would say, you know, I work very closely with the editors. Where are all the practice submissions? Because you'll be shocked at how few we get. And whether this is a confidence issue or people, I don't know what it is. But we need more practice coming through these journals and these publications. And um, uh, I think there is an issue there that we need to look at as a, as a community. And I think part of it is about this thing about how do you publish, how do you publish practice? And how does that relate to the theoretical and the cultural aspects of it? Screenworks already been mentioned. There are challenges around the peer review because that has an open peer review system. <coughs> and I think it's a difficult area because people behave differently when they're doing things in public to when they're doing things in private. I think they'll say different things. So you, one can anonymize it, of course. But one of the issues I would like to throw out to you is that there's a great deal of variation in the quality of the work being produced, both in terms of the journal of media practice, I think in terms of the bids we see in HRC, and, of course, in the things that I've seen coming through ScreenWorks. And I think part of it is because there is actually a lack of understanding about what research is in practice, or what a pra how a practitioner does research, how we evaluate it, what do we define as quality, what do we define as, uh, you know, new knowledge, new understanding. There is not a kind of consistent view about these things that you might get in other disciplines where there's a longer tradition, a more rigid tradition around how, for example, uh, research is presented. And uh, Rachel's already touched on some examples of that. But where I do see some interesting stuff is in PhDs that are, that are currently going through and that I examine and that I supervise. Because I think things are really changing because there's a new generation of researchers coming through who are going through a system of actually uh, uh, an organized system of PhD study that prevents a kind of framework on which to build an understanding of practice. A lot of the staff, for example, I deal with and try to get engaged in practice come from industry and have come straight into HE. And there are difficulties in terms of formulating and articulating practice research or just research. What we have now is a new generation of PhD students coming through in the last few years. And obviously, Rachel, one of them, 2010, was it? Yeah, well, okay. 2011 is when I actually graduated. OK. <laughs> you're part of the new wave. That's why, you know. <laughs> and I think these PhDs offer fantastic opportunities for us to help cement, I think, this new wave. And I think, I think Rachel is an excellent example of this, actually, if you don't mind me saying so. And, and, and the sort of thing that I think we need to encourage. But that also means breaking down, I think, some ideas about, you know, what is good research and what is, what is practice. And, uh, so I thought, well, let me go back to the, the roots. I went back to UNESCO and said, well, what, what do UNESCO say research is? Because you'll find that, you know, with slightly different wordings and slightly different 
you know, emphases and so on, all of these organizations are essentially talking about the same thing. Certain things, you know, I've, I've highlighted this thing about creative systematic activity. Because what is the difference, for example, between somebody doing creative practice in the industry or as an artist outside of the higher education establishment and somebody doing that practice within an institution? I think this is probably one of the aspects that distinguishes uh, those two experiences. That we are talking about, particularly when it comes to methodologies, I always think a good, good methodological design is something somebody else can take and apply to their own project. And that involves a systematic understanding of what one's doing. To be able to say, well, this is how I'm, this is how I'm doing my practice, and this is the sort of process I'm going through, and it might change and it might evolve, but actually that process, that system, is something somebody else can take and run with as a methodological design. That's where that systematic comes in. And then, of course, it's ultimately about new knowledge, new understanding, the usual stuff, new insights, and what has already been discussed, you know, in some ways, new applications. So it could be about existing knowledge applied in new ways. Existing practices applied in new contexts, and the knowledge, the new knowledge that that then uh, uh, generates. And that opens up a lot of very interesting possibilities, for example, to do with archives. And I think there's a lot of interesting, I've seen really interesting archive work coming through the AHRC. A lot of people working with, very creatively with archives. Now this work is going to be assessed. Now this is all stuff you know. But this is, this is literally what the, the AHRC panel, REF, anybody who's going to give you money for research, are going to evaluate it on these three basic principles. And you'd be surprised how when you sit there in a meeting, an uh, AHRC panel meeting, they use these words all the time. What's the significance of this work? Is it, is it potentially going to have any impact? Is it... Is it, uh, you know, in the field that the researcher has defined, is it significant? So, you know, I've seen some stuff that's really about very specialized linguistic stuff, but you can see the significance in that field. So for REF, it's often very narrow. AHRC are, are more interested in bigger impacts, you know, pathways to impacts, as they call it. <coughs> How are people going to access this new knowledge and what potential impacts will it have? Really, really important. And I think very important as artists to talk about that kind of stuff in about one's work. You know, what are the potential impacts and the significance of it? Rigor, I think, often refers to uh, methods of analysis and, and methodologies. And of course, originality. I want to touch on that one because, and I'm, I'm deliberately being provocative here in the sense that I see a lot of great scholarly work accompanying some practice. But the practice is not original at all. And in fact, I saw, see no evidence in the practice of originality, of new knowledge, of new applications. But in the written components, they can talk for Mother England. Yeah. And I think this is a problem we have in, in our particular sector, partly because of the history of who has been driving the research agenda. That this, this, this feeling that somehow, if one writes eloquently about the theory that, that, that surrounds the practice, somehow that's enough. In my book, that's not enough. Because if the field, if the new knowledge is about the practices and the processes involved in the practices, or the applications of the practice, I would like to see some evidence of that originality in the practice or in the processes themselves. So these are kind of the, the kind of debates that one might have about, about um, originality. And so 
you know, Rachel touched a little bit on, on this thing about documentation, the issues that, for example, performance have about what is the nature of the outputs. Uh, for me, it is perfectly possible to create a great research project that achieves these qualities, because these are the qualities the peers are going to look at, embodied in the practice and the creative practice outputs, and embodied in whatever documentation is supporting that. I recently saw a PhD that was a comic book. The entire thing, there was not a single written word outside of the comic itself. Why not? If you can see the problems, you can understand that the practice embodies the question somehow. If the context is somehow embedded in the practice, if somehow you can see the methods and the potential impact in the practice itself, why not? One could support it with some documentation. I think it's increasingly important, particularly where the process of systematizing, you know, in a creative work can be very nebulous. Then it becomes important, perhaps, to document the creative process somehow. Because often, you've got to think, somebody's going to look at this, and they've got to get something out of it. And often, just seeing a creative process at work can itself help somebody see the research value in the work itself. So for example, in my latest feature film, it's not just a feature film, but we made 30 documentaries about the making of the film. Right from concept, right through to final screening. And it was not just me in the film, it was all the people, you know, sound designer and all sorts of other people. So there's a very comprehensive documentation about that creative process, which I hope will help people see the research value in the film itself. And that documentation is just there to help, help that process. But the language I think we need to talk is this, because if you're going to put in a bid to the AHRC, or you want REF to understand what you're, what you're talking about, or you want to, for example, at some point do an interdisciplinary project with a, with a scientist or whatever, this is the language they talk. And my question, you know, that for myself certainly is, how do I articulate my question? How do I embody that in the practice? How do I create a methodology that gives a sense of that creative process that somebody else might be able to take as a, as a design and use something else? How do I do that? How do I talk about that? How do I signpost it? How do I point it out in the work itself? And. Um, And I think that if we start thinking a little bit more like that, I don't think about whether something is practice or theory or whether it's uh, you know, academic or not academic. I think in terms of what's my problem? What does this problem make me ask? And how am I going to put that in my movie? What methods, how am I going to document the methods I'm using to creating my work? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I could end up with a piece that's entirely practice, or I could end up with a hybrid piece that's a bit of theory and practice, or I could end up, sometimes the case, with just a written piece. That doesn't matter. I'm still a practitioner. So for me, I would like to encourage us to break down uh, these kind of very fine definitions about different kinds of practice research and just think about research. And to, in a sense, allow that then to free us to uh, discover new knowledge. Not to get bogged down in, ah, oh, is this practice led or is it practice as? Doesn't matter. Is this theoretical or is it not theoretical? In some cases, I sometimes have this debate with colleagues. You know, a student will have written a PhD thesis, a practice-based one, and there's no literature review. And they'll say, well, why is there no literature review? A uh, student will then quite rightly answer, well, I'm not trying to add new knowledge to the literature. 
I'm trying to add new knowledge to the practice. So what I've done is a contextual review instead. Yeah? And I think we need to sort of challenge and open up these kind of ways of thinking by first and foremost thinking that what we're doing is research, but we are using particular methods and particular outcomes and particular, we're working in a particular field that we want to explore and sometimes that means working with other people, of course, outside of our field, but that we define these and we have a debate with our colleagues in other disciplines on the basis of simply, we are researchers. Yeah? That's me. So I'm envious of uh, Rachel and Eric's ability to speak without notes. It's an ability I don't have, so I'm going to read from my notes. Uh, so first of all, can I just thank uh, Eric and Rachel for their stimulating, thought-provoking presentations. And I have to say right from the outset that uh, I'm in broad agreement uh, with what you just talked about, Eric, and what you said. So what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes or so is to pick up on a few issues prompted by Eric's presentation, uh, but also a recent editorial uh, that Eric wrote for the Journal of Media Practice as the incoming chair of the journal's editorial board. So like Eric, I'm working in the area of film and video, as indeed are many of my colleagues in the Centre of Practice-Based Research in the Arts here at Canterbury Christchurch University. And I think some of us involved in practice-based research in media tend to look slightly enviously at our colleagues in other disciplines, who, it seems to me, have things a bit more worked out than I do. At least I look enviously at these people. So I look at colleagues in music, for example, where it seems, from my perspective, that composition is readily accepted as a form of research. Now, this isn't the business about what we do is research and I'm trying to persuade somebody. It's the ease with which they move from the business... Oh, I'm improvising, sorry. They move from composition to the, the notion of it being research. It's that sort of... Um, now you can tell I'm improvising. That smooth sort of transition that they make, kind of mentally from, that, from one to the other. It seems to me, and it's my perception, that there's not really a problem in music with creative practice being understood as a valid form of research activity. There are no gymnastics to be formed around this performed around this idea. One simply gets on with composing. Of course, there's a business of articulating what you've done as research, which of course in the ref means writing your 300 word statements and putting your box together of supporting materials. But as I said, the key thing that seems to me is, with music, it seems to me that composition is just understood and just accepted as a form of research. Of course, that might not really be the case, but that's my perception. Then I looked at my colleagues in drama, uh, where I understand long, long ago there were battles about whether one actually needed to explain why performance or writing for performance constituted a valid form of research. And what I heard relayed through the colleagues was this super confident declaration that actually just doing this stuff was research. The script is the research, the performance is the research, and that's it. Now, my discipline envy is a product of many things, mainly actually my own ignorance of what's really happening in other people's disciplines. So perhaps really all I'm doing is projecting my fantasies onto the other. It's how I'd like practice research to be, confident, self-assured, and so on. But importantly, importantly, my discipline, envy, also points to the fact that media practice as a form of research is still in its early stages of development at this university, as I think it is within the academy, perhaps more generally. Perhaps, one might argue, despite what we've heard today, even in its infancy. And what I'm about to say, then, is, is a view from this perspective, a view from my perspective. Now, if, as Eric claims, research is research is research, then maybe it follows that practice is practice is practice. And if practice is practice is practice, then maybe it follows that people with a practice background face particular challenges in thinking about themselves as researchers and in thinking about what they do as research. 
Now, I'm not talking about special pleading here, but it seems to me that practice-based researchers in the arts aren't always on an equal footing to other researchers in higher education. I'm re just repeating perhaps elements of what we've already heard. It seems to me actually that the, the playing field isn't level at the moment. Most historians who might end up as academics will probably have a PhD or probably have done, uh, completed a PhD at some point in their career, perhaps early on. And this is definitely research training as the academy understands it, as universities in the traditional form understand it. A media practitioner is less likely to have taken this route. The practice-based PhD is a relatively new phenomenon in our discipline, I think. And the person is more likely to have spent time making films rather than studying for a PhD. And of course, making films, as we've heard from Eric, is not always research as the academy understands it. Eric, is this any good? There's the evidence of that, perhaps. So this is practice, not research. Now, I personally agree with Eric's assertion that arguing that practice researchers are somehow different from other researchers is a dangerous strategy that can only reinforce segregation and encourage notions of these different tiers of researchers. And I agree that creative practice outputs should express and embody new knowledge, the same as any research output. Uh, and this is what Eric's written in, in the, um, the piece that I mentioned from a Journal of Media Practice. He's talking about practice-based researchers. We're trying to solve problems and make discoveries. We're trying to enrich our understandings and expand our knowledge. We're trying to pass on our discoveries to others. Our self-esteem as researchers should be built on these grand ambitions. But the question that I think Eric's presentation raises for me is, well, how do we get there? How do we get to the point where practitioners, perhaps it's only in media, I'm not sure, perhaps it's only me, how do we get to the point where practitioners are as conversant in the established discourse of what constitutes research as historians, geographers, and so on? How do we level the playing field? Bearing in mind practitioners may not have had the same experience of research training and career progression as other researchers. How do we move on to the second wave that Rachel was describing? Now, I don't know how we get there, but I think there are a number of things that we can perhaps think about this afternoon, return to, revisit, uh, and maybe discuss. The first is that if the PhD is research training, then the practice-based PhD should be research training for practitioners. Uh, and as such, it should be designed specifically with the goal of producing a level playing field. Design that so practice-based research students undertake research on an equal footing to all other research students in higher education. This isn't special pleading, but a recognition that practice researchers need the appropriate form of training. Secondly, it seems to me that individual disciplines within the arts have much to learn from each other. And ideas and uh, practice can be shared at events like today's. Although the REF states quite clearly that it supports interdisciplinary research and interdisciplinarity more generally, for understandable administrative reasons, the REF is organised around disciplinary panels. Now, although the REF isn't the only show in town, if you're working in a university, sometimes it feels like it might as well be. So in our REF-driven reveries, often we found ourselves looking inward rather than looking outward, looking at ourselves. So what I'm suggesting here is the active cultivation of discipline envy, which I hope would then lead to genuine interdisciplinary exchange. And I see this as being quite hard to do in institutions where the research agenda is very much driven by the REF and you're in your own UOA. I see this as being a, a, a real challenge. And it's events like this, and perhaps our centre, that can perhaps kind of work against that a little bit. Um, and then related to this, what I would also like us to think about, again, sort of riffing off Eric's uh, presentation or rethink about, is the relationship between theory and practice. I think all too often theorisation is treated as a kind of post hoc, almost retrospective commentary on practice. So the, the 300 word supporting statement is a great opportunity for us to explain what we're doing. Um, but it tends to be a statement written for the ref with a, um, a sort of perfunctory reference to a couple of 
uh, key texts that help to locate your work within theori theoretical context. Uh, you know, here's our moment to sort of theorise practice. It's a kind of, it's supplemental. And I guess that this is my slight concern with the notice of complementary writing, that it is complementary, it isn't the thing itself. But what about work that takes theory as a starting point, or even better, blurs the distinction between theory and practice, so that practice itself becomes a form of theorisation, a form of theory rather than an illustration or a proof uh, of some theoretical pre premise or a kind of riff on some theoretical premise. Now, I don't know what that would be or what form it would take, but I find it an exciting idea to think about and one that I'd like to see practice researchers much more engage with. And I don't think this necessarily has to be a change of sort of destination. That is, we don't have to forget about research is research is research. You know, that is to say, it would still be about meeting the expectations that Eric has discussed in terms of research and what constitutes research. But it would provide perhaps another means by which practice research could other explore other exciting potentialities within research, uh, explore other pathways to the creation of new knowledge. And that's my view. Thank you. So we've got time for questions. <laughs> the question. Comments, thoughts? A question. If you can take it, as research, if you took a painter like Francis Bacon, how would you expect him to describe his methodology, how he was going to do it? Well, well actually, he did quite oh. rather well. Did he? Yes. yes. Oh, right, yes. he did. In yes. three he, months. He would have been okay to get his Oh, really? One way or another. Thanks, Tim. Great. Eric, or, would you like to respond to that? Or, or, yeah, yeah, or, right. or Kandinsky. I mean, oh yeah, Kandinsky is not a fair I, I, I think a great example of, of practice-based research before it was kind of established in the age was actually Jean Rouge, as a, you know, documentary filmmaker, French, you know, for example, things like Chronicle of the Summer, which is a very interesting way of exploring the state of France in 1968. But the film itself was really original, and you could see the questions he was asking in the film itself. You know, yeah. it's very well done. So, so, um, but it doesn't always have to be written, you know. No, it was, it, what was interesting, I thought, was, uh, you know, this question of AHRC, I've known several composers have been wrecked for a little while, having gone through the AHRC process, and I've done it twice. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. You know, it is work, and it's work you could be doing in other ways, and you do it because you think it might take you somewhere else. But I think that may partly explain your lack of practitioners, you know, um, may partly. I don't know that it would. There are plenty of practitioners, but they're not necessarily in the media and film area. So I've seen sonic artists going through and getting huge sums of money because sonic they're doing interdisciplinary projects, you know, for example, about um, urbanization in the city, or you might see other types of, you know, performance-based projects. Mm -hmm that are very, very interdisciplinary, um, that are getting huge sums of money. Yeah, yeah, I can believe that. So, uh, just as an example, um, Ben Spatz, who works at the University of Huddersfield, and he's just won an early AHRC Early Career um, Leadership Fellowship, uh, where he's going to investigate particular traditions of Jewish performer training. Um, and there's these two postdoctoral researchers that he's hiring, they're going to be two performers. Um, and they're going to make work. And that's going to be the outcome of the leadership, is they're going to make work through making work. Um, and then he's going to have a hub up in Huddersfield that do this. I mean, Huddersfield support this quite well. Um, but it is happening. It is happening. And it is interesting to hear from other disciplines. If it's yeah, I, I mean, it is interesting because the problem with music is partly a problem of sensation. How do you describe sensation? You know, you talk about visual. Your, your envy of... of <laughs> Composers, perhaps, but how? I, I mean, I'm looking at um, Paul Whitty's description here. Well, I I know what it means because I've done it. But would I know what it means if I hadn't? That's it's the uh, oh yeah yeah okay. yeah. It's interesting, you know. 
and it actually describes it extremely well. But uh, I'm sorry, I'd just like to thank Steve. Hi. Hi, Jan. Just pick up on that point if that's okay, because I, I was thinking the same thing as I was listening to the presentations we've heard so far. Um, I com I'm in the middle of a practice-based PhD in composition and sound, uh, or sound composition, but my question is really about this discipline-specific thing that's emerging within co the compositional discipline at the moment. There, there are some composers who are raising, who are basically saying composition is not research, and these are people within academia. Um, and I find this quite a fascinating issue. What appears to be happening is that because these sound waves that we are dealing with don't have, uh, are not symbolic of or uh, representing any, anything else other than themselves, there is no subject to which they refer, um, they have, I think, a specific problem in relation to research because the question can only then be in some ways methodological about how you chose to put those particular sensations in the particular order that they happen to come in in your composition. And I, I, I'm saying this really to draw out anyone who, who's got any specific views on this because I, I think, well, because of my research, I'm very interested in that. And also wondering whether people from other disciplines, uh, and also I should say I work interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary way in all, almost all the contexts I work in. But I do think that there's an issue with some of the AHRC money being, or rather, composers feeling uh, that their work is not being recognised because the sonic artists who can do city mapping and things that have some sort of specific agenda that's outside of music, uh, so-called, if there is such a thing, uh, are, get, are getting those grants and the composers who define themselves within a particular bubble are not getting those grants. And, and I wonder if anyone's yeah, going to Yeah, uh, maybe yes. I can. I mean, first of all, you don't have to go for grants to be doing research. No. Yeah. You have to recognize that when public money is being given out, they sure. have an agenda they need to fulfill. And whatever it is you're doing, you somehow need to be supporting that. You know? And that agenda usually revolves around some form of impact. And if there is a way in which you can articulate your research as having potential impact, then that's when they start becoming interested. interested. So even though you're working in a very narrow field, if you can articulate the impact that it might have in that narrow field, mm -hmm. that will be really helpful. I think this is partly, that's if you want to go for money, you know. <laughs> but you don't have to go for money. No, it's not, uh, yeah, as I say, it's something, I, uh, for my own particular work, I'm not, I'm not uh, that's not my concern. No. I'm interested in the debate that's going on within the cons composition and sound world uh, specifically, which is about whether or not there's a difference between the specific disciplinary requirements or the ways in which we articulate research within music and the way it might be framed or articulated within other disciplines. Because so far we've heard about disciplines like film or drama where there is you know, a script or a, a subject or a, something that you can talk about. How do you have school? Some, some, many times there are no schools. <coughs> I, would just like to I think Rachel, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to suggest that the next talk that we will hear is about music. Oh, okay. Maybe we should just right. save some of this discussion until the more general um, panel, because we've got <coughs> perhaps a small amount of time now, and it would be great if we had some questions that were directly related to what we've heard, and then we maybe can take this wider discussion afterwards, if that's okay. So Rachel, you were going to make some... music, so I'll say that. <laughs> okay. And then we've got a comment or a question over here behind you, Will, so... Um, yeah, I was going to say I've got a similar kind of tension where, um, with the lens-based work. I'm not a PhD, so I'm doing an MA, so I'm still fleshing these ideas out, but problem is as well that not everyone interprets lens-based work through strict linguistics or semiology as well, so that when you try to uh, replicate your idea through the written form, there's not always a kind of a clear uh, translation. Um, and actually, you, uh, Lord Roosh or Antonioni, for example, can make work that uh, one could interpret it on a sensory basis or on a sense basis. This is my idea of there's lots of different philosophies. Absolutely. Yeah. My um, point is simply don't start from the principle of excusing what you're doing mm -hmm. or, or saying in advance other people won't understand it. Mm -hmm. yeah? My feeling is it's, it's part of the challenge for you is to make other people understand what you're trying to do. Well, I think actually my work actually placed the work in public spaces. Yeah. 
so that because there's also idea of writing a proposal about sort of dumbing down and I think it, for me it doesn't feel like that actually you can make this work and it's about this idea of medium over message there are tensions and I think it's okay to make work where they don't fit you don't have to make them so I think there's also this idea about making stuff that's harmonious um, I don't understand <laughs> where you have to have a final output where these things do connect sometimes it doesn't work and actually that's okay and I think that when you put work in the public space is that, is that not a theory? We theorise on a daily basis. But it doesn't matter. Theories, that they can theorise. Yeah. They don't have to follow that, that doctrinisation of this way art college thinking. Yeah. I so mean, my argument would be whether something is theory or practice is actually slightly irrelevant mm -hmm. because it's about the knowledge that's being generated. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I find it slightly strange that some people will say, I have a, I have a PhD and then they'll say, I have it in theory or I have it in practice. I mean, you have a PhD. Yeah. And out of that PhD, you generated some knowledge. But people will do it in different ways and in different mediums and in different forms. And, 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 uh, and I think we just need to have the confidence mm. to go out there and, and, and say, look, I'm really excited about the problems I'm exploring. And, and, and uh, this is what I'm doing. And by the way, I think, you know, uh, it's great stuff, and, and knowledge need not be either practice or theory. You know, it's. it's I think also about this idea of using uh, not necessarily work that illuminates a particular theory. You get bogged down in that. Um, then, uh, Brad Butler and Kevin Merckson kind of work with uh, different work, uh, philosophers, and they wrote that uh, to read yourself into a position of crisis and then make your work from that, rather than necessarily making the work the arising after. I think that seems quite pertinent to discussion mm. we've got a couple of responses i think so first will and then if i come no, to you it's cool i may have lost it by the time i guess okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah no no it's just um, i mean uh, 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 answer well. it's just this notion of um impact from working film in, in a way um if you're coming from a position of uh, practices research from a phd um I mean, what I was interested in, in terms of uh, what Rachel was saying, is that you, your work um, you suggested or implied that it evolved through the process, there was discovery. So presumably there was a research question at the start, but somehow that changed, or maybe it was perhaps even more ephemeral than that. And then mapping that over onto film, that uh, again, um, it, it sh struck me as somebody's gone through that process of uh, looking at improvisation within film. Um, which is by, by its own nature is a very ephemeral thing, is, is how do you make that work count uh, in, in terms of impact later on? And that's clearly what the ref is really considering. That's one of the key things is, you know, where does this work live, it, it, uh, that it has that kind of impact? Because as a filmmaker, as you know, it's an expensive process. You, you don't just happen to stumble across it one Friday night. I mean, I feel the answer to that question is always in yourself. I mean, you can, you can be looking at other people's impact agendas, but you will have a reason why you want to do this research, presumably because you think it's important for some reason. And that's where your potential impact is going to be. So it's about articulating that. And they don't know what impact you, you're going to have. But you tell them, I think I need to do this because there's this problem. And if I, if I look at this problem, I might discover some new things that could influence something, you know. But it's because it's the reason is because of why you want to do the research in the first place. And that's that's often where I think the impact should be sought. Right. I think um, it might be time to um, draw this bit of the session to a close and uh, have some refreshments. But before we do that, can we? Uh, thank Eric for his presentation. Thanks very much.